Israel Finkelstein is a leading figure in the archaeology and history of ancient Israel. Over 40 years of fieldwork and research, he has helped to change the way archaeology is conducted, the Bible is interpreted, and the history of Israel is reconstructed. I sat down with Israel over several sessions to talk about how a lifetime of work has informed the story of ancient Israel. Welcome back to Kiryat Yarim, Israel. Happy to be back. Today we uh, are speaking about a topic that in many ways we've been building up to for, through most of this conversation. And in one way or another, it's been weaving through all of our previous conversations. That is the Deuteronomistic history. This big word is a very important part of, of the Bible as we know it today. So start by telling us what exactly is the Deuteronomistic history, and then we'll start to tear it apart. The Deuteronomistic history is a theory, is a notion of biblical scholars who noticed long ago the similarity in uh, ideas, ideology, language in several books of the Bible, starting with the book of Joshua, but in fact with the book of Deuteronomy. But Deuteronomy is low, and then we shift to history, quote unquote, in Joshua, Judges, the two books of Samuel, and the two books of Kings, meaning from the conquest of Canaan to the fall of Jerusalem uh, under the Babylonian assault. This is the part which is described by biblical scholars as the Deuteronomistic history, and they call it Deuteronomistic history because of the uh, relationship to the book of Deuteronomy, uh, ideology, theology, and, uh, and language. Of course, the books of the Deuteronomistic history are preceded by another piece of history in the Bible. I refer here to the story of the patriarchs and the story of Exodus in the Pentateuch. So uh, the question is uh, how to deal uh, with the relationship between the two parts. I am not going to go into details today about this, just to say that one can trace Deuteronomistic uh, hand also in, the, in several places in the Pentateuch for sure. And uh, one can uh, argue that there was a moment, perhaps in late monarchic times, some would say later, that uh, these books were conceived together as telling the story of the history of ancient Israel from the very, very beginning all the way down to the destruction of Jerusalem. In any event, today, when we speak about the Deuteronomistic history, we speak about the block from Joshua to Kings. Would you call the Deuteronomistic history history? Well, this is one of the most important questions. It is not history as we relate to history today. The idea is not to tell you exactly what happened. The idea is to convey ideology, to convey theology to tell you about the relationship of the God of Israel to the people of Israel and the history of Israel, so to speak, or the fate of Israel. The idea is to tell you about the importance of the Davidic dynasty uh, in the life uh, of the people of Israel. The idea is to uh, tell you about the centrality of Jerusalem and the importance of the temple in Jerusalem. So from, these, from this point of view, it is not really history as we describe history, not even as Herodotus describes history, but it is history in the sense that it gives you the ideas of the people, of the composers, in my opinion, first in late monarchic times, their idea, ideas about uh, what happened, uh, in fact, uh, in the past, how did the past uh, lead to the present, which means to their time, and also their ideas about perhaps uh, the future. From this point of view, the composers of the Deuteronomistic history, they are using two platforms in order to convey their ideas. One platform, of course, is the law in Deuteronomy, and another platform is their way of understanding history. You talked about the Deuteronomistic history being a, a theory of biblical composition by modern biblical scholars. Uh, Many of these scholars also posit that there are, are multiple versions of the Deuteronomistic history that kind of get put together. How many do you see? So the idea of a Deuteronomistic history comes from Martin Knott, a German scholar, a great biblical scholar, who uh, was uh, active in the middle of the 
uh, 20th century. But in fact, without calling it Deuteronomistic history, the idea comes from the beginning of the 19th century, from one, some of the earliest biblical scholars, such as uh, De Vete, and in a way, of course, uh, Wellhausen, uh, in the 19th century. Now, there are several questions here. First of all, how many editions are there uh, of the Deuteronomistic uh, history, which means uh, the composition and the reductions uh, of the story? And the second, I should say, when uh, was it composed for the first time? And uh, here there are several different versions. Martin notes was of the idea that the Deuteronomistic history is a work of exilic times. After the destruction of Judah, the need to explain what exactly happened. And he saw all this as one story telling uh, uh, the fate of Judah after the destruction by the Babylonians in 586 BC. So this is one version regarding the Deuteronomistic history. Then there is another version according to which the beginning is in late monarchic times, in the time of uh, King uh, Josiah of Judah, which means in the late seventh century. This comes from the early scholars of the early 19th century, but then the scholar who promoted this uh, in a very significant way is uh, Frank Moore, of course, the American uh, biblical scholar, uh, uh, starting in the 1970s. According to Coase, and also before him, the first version, so to speak, of the Deuteronomistic history was composed in Jerusalem in the time of King Josiah, and later we can discuss why King Josiah. In any event, the first version uh, uh, in late monarchic times. But then the story itself tells you what happened after also the destruction of Jerusalem. So indeed, you need to uh, uh, think about the second composer after the destruction who intervened uh, in order to explain uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and also planted his ideas throughout the, the Deuteronomistic history before the destruction, in the story before the destruction. So we are speaking about the, Deut the first Deuteronomistic historian and the second one, the first in late monarchic times, and the second after the destruction of Jerusalem. And then, of course, there are later editions as well. I think that today many scholars, not all, but many scholars are more and more convinced that there was an early version in late monarchic times. This is not what we see today in the Bible, of course, because today we see the final product with many layers. But many scholars would say today that there was an early writing, an early composition in the time of Josiah, and that uh, it uh, was uh, added to and redacted several times after, including after the destruction of Jerusalem. So most scholars, as you say, are talking about two different versions of the Deuteronomistic history. Uh, an earlier one uh, from the time of Josiah, and then a later one that's an update after the destruction of Jerusalem. Why is the first one associated with Josiah? For different reasons, all of them uh, come from uh, internal biblical compositions and the general background of the time. I should start, I think, with the story uh, in the Bible of uh, the time of Josiah when there is renovation of the temple and they find a book. And they find a book, they come to Josiah, they tell him what's written in the book and Josiah becomes really worried and says, well, we are not behaving according to this book, the Torah the book of the law, and uh, most people think that the story about the finding of the book relates to the book of Deuteronomy. I suppose not exactly finding Deuteronomy, but writing uh, Deuteronomy as the law platform of the time of King Josiah. But this is not uh, all. It needs to be put in late monarchic times to explain the prosperity in Judah, to explain the hopes of Judah. Uh, it is a Jerusalem, I definitely, composition there are certain parts of it in which uh, one can trace similarities between uh, Josiah and the uh, past personalities in the Bible. Uh, the Kyle MacArthur at the time suggested that there is a similarity between Josiah and Joshua. Then there is definitely 
some sort of looking at Josiah as the new, ki uh, the new King David. So there is a back and forth between Josiah and past personalities in the uh, biblical story. There is also no logic of writing something like that except for explaining what happened, you know, in, uh, in the time after the destruction. Finally, there is, there is one more point which is important to remember. Those biblical scholars, Kors and others, who speak about uh, the first Deuteronomistic historian being uh, a composer in the time of King Josiah, they uh, really identify the place where the first Deuteronomistic version ended. And this is very convincing because it all comes to this description of Josiah as the ultimate pious, righteous king of the lineage of David. And finally, there's this verse in uh, chapter 23 of the book of uh, the second book of Kings, which says about Josiah, there was no king before him and there will be no king like him after, after him. So this is probably according to course, and I, I, I agree with this, this is the place where the first version ended. And then the second Deuteronomistic historian had to tell the story after King Josiah. What happened? Why it did not materialize? All these great hopes of the kingdom of Josiah. We need also, of course, to uh, remember that Josiah lived in a time where the Assyrians pulled out. And there was this opportunity, at least in the eyes of the king and the people around him, to fulfill ideas which uh, perhaps uh, emerged in Judah after the fall of the Northern Kingdom, after the fall of Israel. So there was this moment that the Assyrians are out and they can think about fulfilling the territorial ideology of Judah. So all this put together, I think, is quite convincing for arguing that uh, the first uh, composition is from the time of King Josiah. And the second Deuteronomistic historian who picked up where the first guy left off, what are the circumstances of, of his composition? The second composer picks up uh, from this point of Josiah with the great hopes in Judah, but the whole thing collapsed with the killing, the execution of Josiah at Megiddo in 609 by King Necho of Egypt of the 26th dynasty. And then 25 years later, after the death of Josiah, Judah falls. Uh, Jerusalem is destroyed by the Babylonians. So the second composer is telling the story from this uh, prosperity and many hopes in the time of Josiah to the destruction of Jerusalem. There are several verses at the end of the second book of Kings which tell the story after the fall of Jerusalem. There is a debate among biblical scholars whether they belong to the second Deuteronomist, Deuteronomistic historian or whether they can uh, be considered as another edition. In any event, the Deuteronomistic historian uh, uh, has another mission, not only to tell the end of the story, but to also explain uh, what's going to happen, uh, which means if you end the, the story, if you pick up only with the great hopes of the time of Josiah, there is a problem of explaining what exactly happened there, that the God of Israel deserted the, the people of Israel and made possible the destruction of Jerusalem. So there are verses in, along the way in the Deuteronomistic history which were planted by the second Deuteronomistic historian in order to explain what happened. Uh, let me um, uh, give you an example. In the Deuteronomistic history, they blamed King Manasseh for the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, King Manasseh ruled before Josiah. So if Josiah is so pious, how is it that Jerusalem was destroyed? So there is an explanation there, which means that Manasseh was so evil that even the great pity of Josiah was not enough in order to save Jerusalem from uh, destruction because of the anger of the God of Israel, uh, because of, the, uh, of, 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 of Manasseh and the uh, other transgressions of the people of Israel. So the second Deuteronomistic historian is not just tacking on the rest of the story. He has to go back to the previous versions and make it all click. Absolutely. Let's see. Let's focus on the first one for a moment. Uh, where did the first Deuteronomistic historian get his materials? Good question, because we know today that there is no composition of history before 
in, in the two kingdoms of Israel and Judah combined before 800 BC. We described this in the past and in Judah apparently not before the, I would say not before the time of Hezekiah in the late 8th century. So then the question is how does the Deuteronomistic historian know about the early beginnings? This is a complicated question. I will try to answer it very, uh, in, in, a, in a very concise way. I would say that first of all, uh, uh, the Deuteronomistic historian had access to material that came from the north. And in the north we have indications for possibility of composition in the first half of the 8th century. So the first half of the 8th century, 800 BC, is closer to the beginning than let's say 700 BC. And, uh, and this is one thing to, to, to remember because there is reason to suggest that uh, in Israel, in the north, there was not only composition of uh, cycles such as the Jacob cycle in the Pentateuch or, or the, some very early description of Exodus or royal traditions such as the tradition uh, of uh, Saul or Jeroboam uh, first, there is reason to suggest that there was some sort of an attempt to compose a history or a, a continuity of the Hebrew monarchs, listing them with the, in the two kings, in two kingdoms, with the, the length of reign and the cross reference between them. This could have been done in order to show that Israel dominates Judah. This could have been done in the time of Jeroboam II. We spoke about him quite a lot. So this could have been some sort of a skeleton of information for the Deuteronomistic historian that came also from the north and was composed for the first time in the first uh, half of the 8th century. On top of this, of course, we have traditions of Judah itself that are also represented definitely in the Deuteronomistic history. Let me give you the most obvious example, the story of the early days of King uh, David on the southern fringe of Judah as the leader of a group uh, of a sort of mercenaries and the whole uh, story of how he came to power, the rise of David to power. So the rise of David to power in the first book of uh, Samuel has uh, several parts to it and uh, there are several voices in it, but there is definitely, definitely also a voice that comes from, from Judah, from Jerusalem. What theological and ideological ideals does this first Deuteronomistic historian have in mind? Among the most important ideologies, I wish to emphasize two. There are more, but I wish to speak about two. The first one is just to mention in passing, of course, it is very obvious, the centrality of the temple in Jerusalem, the importance of centralization of cult in one temple, in one place, in Jerusalem. I think that I wish to uh, elaborate a little bit about the second component. The second component is the territorial one. And territorial ideology is always important because it relates directly to uh, history and geopolitical situations. The territorial ideology there is very simple. The historian, the Deuteronomistic historian, of course acknowledges that there were two Hebrew kingdoms, Israel and Judah. And he has this ideology that the territories and people of the two Hebrew kingdoms need to be under the domination of the king of Judah and the temple in Jerusalem. So this is the root of the idea of a great united monarchy when a king in Jerusalem rules over the entire population of Israel and Judah combined. So the ideology is very simple here. The Deuteronomistic historian says to the northerners, your uh, kingdom was uh, illegitimate. Your kings were illegitimate. Most of them were bad anyway and they did not go in the path of the God of Israel and they needed to be punished. And they brought about this destruction of the kingdom of, of, of Israel. However, you people, if you accept the importance, the centrality of the temple in Jerusalem and the rule of a Davidic dynasty, you are part of the nation. So this is a very important uh, component. Now we need to ask when exactly did this start? What was the 
thing that ignited this territorial ideology because we know that Judah was dominated by, by Israel. So there is no way but to say that after the fall of Israel, this was the moment that uh, the scene was ready for a claim, an opposite claim, that the two kingdoms need to be ruled from Jerusalem rather than from Samaria and by a Davidic king rather than by a king uh, of Israel. However, it was not very easy to sell, so to speak, a territorial ideology while the Assyrians were there. So in my opinion, I suspect, although I cannot prove, that there are two phases there that we can also sense, that we can also feel in the text. An early territorial ideology which starts promoting these ideas, but which is directed mainly to the population of Judah, which in the time of Hezekiah, after the fall of the north, is already composed of Israelites and Judahites together. So it is an overarching territorial ideology about the Israelites and the people of Israel, north and south, but it is directed to the people of Judah, to the people of Jerusalem. And then only with the pull out of Assyria in the time of King Josiah, all of a sudden the scene opened, so to speak, and it was possible to start promoting this idea and to the people who actually lived in the territories that uh, used to be part of the Northern Kingdom before. And this could have been one of the reasons which uh, brought about the bitter end of Josiah because the, he could have promoted an ideology which endangered the uh, uh, policies of uh, Egypt uh, and the uh, hopes of Egypt uh, in the Levant after the pullout of Assyria. Can you give us a few examples of this territorial aspiration? Two examples are uh, more evident than others, I think. The f and, and we have already discussed both of them, but let me repeat uh, for the sake of uh, presenting this in a, in a complete way. First of all, the conquest of the land. The idea of the conquest of the land is the conquest of the entire territory which will be uh, the territory of the two Hebrew kingdoms together. Uh, Josiah, as I mentioned, is presented in a way, uh, as Kyle MacArthur mentioned, is presented in a way as uh, Joshua and Joshua as uh, Josiah. And please remember my idea that the conquest, the earliest conquest tradition comes from the north and is also expressed in the geography of the northern tales such as the uh, uh, stories of the saviors in the book of uh, Judges. Another uh, strong ideology, of course, uh, 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 is the ideology of the United Monarchy, and they are uh, related to each other. The conquest and the United Monarchy, they are part of the same story. They are part of the story how the composer looks at the history of, of ancient Israel before him in the very early days. So there is this description of an ideal a uh, great uh, united monarchy ruling over big territories from this uh, wonderful city of Jerusalem with palace and temple in the time of David and more so even in the time of uh, King Solomon, the great builder uh, in Jerusalem. We need to acknowledge that Josiah is uh, described as the one who is going to, to refulfill this uh, united monarchy. The ideology there is very simple. There was this great united monarchy. The people of Israel sinned, especially Solomon, in the later days of his reign. And because of that, that the God of Israel decided to break uh, the united uh, monarchy and made Israel um, uh, to uh, quit to establish its own uh, kingdom in the north. Uh, however, here comes a time that Josiah will be able to re-establish the great united monarchy from a wonderful city, Jerusalem, and really bring about the ultimate prosperity under the rule of the God of Israel and the law uh, of the God of Israel. This ideology too, in my opinion, comes from the north, not in the full sense of what I have just described, but from the sense of the cent central idea in it. I think that there was a moment in the history, I'm just repeating what we have already discussed, 
there was a moment in the history of the two kingdoms when Israel ruled over Judah and in fact established some sort of a great united monarchy, but it was ruled from Samaria in the first half of the 8th century. And this was very well known to the composer, to the author of the Deuteronomistic uh, history. For It was well known to the author of the, the Josianic uh, author of the Deuteronomistic history. He took it and simply changed it uh, and uh, expressed it in a different way in order to show and promote the idea of a great united monarchy ruled from Jerusalem by a Davidic king. When we look at the Deuteronomistic history as a whole today, we're also drawn into reading the Pentateuch as part of the overall story. Are there any of these Deuteronomistic ideals present in the Pentateuch? Sure. Uh, we uh, have not discussed maybe enough the uh, Judite, the southern patriarchal tradition of Abraham and in a way also Isaac, but especially Abraham. Uh, there is a dispute in biblical scholarship about the uh, rise of the character of Abraham. About Jacob there is some sort of an understanding that this is an early tradition that comes from the north and from the 8th century. But what about Abraham? Abraham as the patriarch of the southern highlands, not so much Jerusalem, but the area of Hebron, the area of Mamre, the central uh, shrine was probably at Mamre, the original tomb of the patriarch was there. And then later, of course, in exilic, post-exilic times, the idea of Machpelah at Hebron. But the uh, core of the story, in my opinion, comes from Judah. I don't think uh, that there is a possibility to describe the two Hebrew kingdoms with patriarchal traditions only in one of them in the north because there was a competition between the two and once there was the patriarchal tradition of Jacob in the north I suppose that there must have been also some sort of a patriarchal tradition also in the south so I would say that uh, the character of Abraham and the early narrative comes from late monarchic Judah. Now we have discussed this too, the importance of the character of Jacob as the early patriarch. However, today Jacob is the third in the triad. The, it starts with Abraham and goes to Isaac and goes to uh, Jacob. And we also mentioned that uh, the composer, the author, makes Abraham go to shrines in the north and makes Jacob go to places in the south. The question then is the time of composition of the patriarchal narrative together as a triad, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And this, I think, comes from the time of late monarchic Judah and is part of the message to show the dominance of Judah, the centrality of Judah, the importance of Judah uh, in the ancient Hebrew traditions. All this talk about theology and territorial ideology, of course, the Deuteronomistic historian has stretched this across the entire history of Israelites and Judah, but there's, a, there's an historical moment that, that this person is living in, the Deuteronomistic historian. And so how do, what's the intersection between the history of his day and this territorial ideology. This is the moment when uh, we can really compare ideology to history and see the difference between the two genres. So, uh, they are completely different and there is no way to, to judge between the two. Look, the, the best way to look at these things is to describe the Assyrian century in the history of Judah. And this has been done by uh, my uh, uh, colleague and friend Nadav Naaman in a, in a very, brilliant, I think, way. We have three, main, mainly three monarchs at that time in Judah, starting with Ahaz, and then Hezekiah, and then Manasseh. Ahaz is the king of Judah in the time when Judah is incorporated into the Assyrian Empire. Hezekiah later uh, rebels against uh, Sennacherib, and Manasseh is the one who brings uh, Judah back to life after the big destruction of parts of the uh, kingdom by Sennacherib in 701 BC. So the Bible describes Ahaz as a sinner, and Hezekiah as a pious king, and Manasseh as the ultimate sinner. 
However, this is theology. When we look at history, we see the opposite. It's like an opposite mirror. Ahaz uh, was very clever not to rebel against Assyria, and because of him, Judah managed to survive. Hezekiah took a terrible decision, a, a, a fateful decision, and brought about uh, almost the final destru destruction of the kingdom in 701 from the hands of Sennacherib. And Manasseh, who is described as the ultimate villain, in fact is the one who brings uh, Judah back to life and brings about the big prosperity in cooperation into the Assyrian economy. So we see here the tension between ideology, or better said, theology and the uh, historical facts. Let's uh, talk a little bit about cult and cultic reforms, especially during this uh, as late Assyrian century and, and thereafter. Uh, we talk about cult reform in the days of Hezekiah and cult reform in the days of Josiah. Give me some archeological context to these biblical theological statements. Indeed, uh, this relates to one of the main pillars of the Deuteronomistic ideology, uh, the centrality of Jerusalem, centralization of cult in Jerusalem. The Bible describes indeed two cult reforms in the time of Hezekiah in the time, and in the time of Josiah. There is big dispute about it. And these two reforms have been dealt uh, for uh, the last uh, decades by many biblical scholars, uh, you know, there is an endless number of articles uh, about uh, the two reforms uh, in late monarchic times. I'm giving you my take on this here. In my opinion, uh, for Hezekiah, there is evidence for centralization. However, it's not centralization in a naive way. It is the situation in Judah after the fall of Israel, with the incorporation of many people from Israel into the population of Judah and the need to strengthen the rule of the Davidic king over the countryside, shrines, and so on. So this is the reason. It's a political move rather than, uh, you know, a cult reform per se. Uh, I'm saying this because I think that when we look very carefully at the situation in the countryside temples of Arad, what we know about Beersheba, from excavations, from the field. In a way also um, about Lachish, the main town in the Shefela. I think that in these three places there are indications for secession of activity in the shrines uh, before 701 BC, before 701, which means in uh, the late 8th century BC. So I would say that this can be related to Hezekiah who came to the throne in the late 8th century BC. But of course, again, not uh, simply in a simplistic way, not as, you know, citing, you know, a cult reform per se, but as a political move, an administrative, bureaucratic move of a grip over the economy, over the countryside shrines. For Josiah, the situation is even more complicated because we evidently do not have enough information uh, from the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Uh, so this makes it difficult and we don't have enough information from Bethel. Please remember that the main target of the cult reform in the time of King Josiah is the very much hated Northern Temple uh, at Bethel, which posed some sort of a cult threat to the tradition, traditions of Judah, to Judah. And there is a very detailed description of uh, Josiah's move to the north, to Bethel, destruction, annihilation of activity there and so on. However, we have no information about this uh, on the ground, so we really don't know. The only thing that we can say is, so we, we don't know about, I should say, the royal attitude uh, or royal reform in Judah. What we can say is when we look at the details of the daily life, not only in countryside places, let's say here at Kiryat Yarim, which at that time is already part of Judah in the time of Josiah, but even in Jerusalem when you excavate places which are 200 meters away from the Temple Mount, from the Temple of Jerusalem, you see that the daily family cult, uh, the popular cult of the kingdom was 
very much as it used to be before. So you certainly do not sense the cult reform there. The Deuteronomistic ideal that you've just described doesn't end with the destruction of Jerusalem. You've already said that a, somebody else, a second Deuteronomistic historian, takes up the mantle and writes the ongoing story. But we also see these ideas kind of morph and continue into uh, the Persian period and beyond. So next time we're going to be talking about the uh, late biblical historiographic literature of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. See you next time. See you.